Okay, welcome everybody to the weekly seminar organized by the Simons Bootstrap Collaboration. Today we are very happy to have Sebastian Misera from the IS. He'll tell us about recent progress on crossing symmetry. Um, all right, thank you. Thank you, Leonardo, and thank you for the invitation to give this seminar. Uh, I'm really happy to see everyone here. Uh, I'm going to start very slowly. In fact, I'm going to start with a, with a brief historical remark. This year in 2021, we're actually celebrating the 80th anniversary of the first ever Feynman diagram. So here's how it looked like in the very old fashioned and very simplified notation. And that diagram appeared in, a, in an old and rather obscure paper of Stuckelberg in 1941. However, that wasn't even the most exciting part about the, the, this, this paper. In the very much same work, he made the revolutionary, at least revolutionary at the time, observation that free electrons are indistinguishable from free positrons moving back in time. So now, obviously, the question is uh, that we will be addressing in this work is to what, to what extent this property also um, holds in interacting quantum field theories. Of course, in quantum field theories, to make the statement precise, we need to state it at the level of observables. So the, the question that we're asking is if we consider some electron or a, any other particle and another process, you, including an antiparticle moving back in time, and then we measure it in some scattering process, such as this one, the question is, are these really described by the same function? And let me emphasize that for, for, the, for this indistinguishability to be true, um, it's really supposed to be independent of the way that we observe this fact. So this means that if we wanted to prove this property, it needs to be independent. It needs to be true for any number and any type of the remaining particles that we use to measure this this um, um, this situation. So this this uh, this um, uh, is made concrete in a famous. Uh, a conjecture called crossing symmetry. And on the more concrete level, it asks whether two scattering amplitudes are really boundary values of a single analytic function. So it dates back to, to uh, the 50s, where it was proposed by Gilman and collaborators. So uh, hopefully, I don't need to explain to, to this audience that we have only a limited amount of evidence that to support this, this conjecture. And let me just uh, briefly review what are the strongest results that we know about, about crossing. So the, the, the one that I'm sure everyone is familiar with is that if we consider a two-to-two scattering process, such as this one in the EDS channel, and the similar in the T or the U channel, then we can analytically continue between those, those, uh, those processes. And this is, a, this is a famous result of Gross, Epstein, and Glaser, which was um, initiated in the 60s, and really the, the uh, most uh, stringent results have been completed in the 80s where a similar result has been proven also for five point processes. And more specifically for the five point processes where we scattered two to three, but not necessarily uh, crossing between two to three and three to two scattering. Okay, so these, uh, these are proven in the axiomatic quantum field theory using the standard assumptions of Microcausality, locality, entirety, as well as the mass gap. So before diving, so how crucial is the? Sorry, how crucial is the mass gap assumption? Yeah, so let, let me let me. Uh, uh, it, it is it is central to the argument, and that's exactly what what I wanted to uh, review very briefly in the next um, part of this slide. Is that uh, with the open problems regarding crossing symmetry. Uh, um, include any process involving massless particles. And uh, as I said, in this, in this old approach, which was using LSD reduction and so on and so on, uh, the, the masslessness of the internal states was absolutely crucial. The proof would just break down in the first step. Another, another open problem is crossing between different numbers of in and out states. So for example, if we take this two to three scattering, and then what we want to do is exchange this particle three into an antiparticle three bar. So we want to move it on the other side. That is still an open problem as well. And this is obviously a qualitatively distinct um, uh, situation to what has been proven in the past. 
And finally, the, this was the first category, second, and the, the final category is any amplitude involving more than five external particles. This was also the jury is still out whether crossing symmetry holds in those cases. And let me just emphasize what, what the meaning of this five here is, really starting at five, uh, multiplicity five and high, or rather higher than five, um, is the situation where the constraints from the four dimensionality of space time first start to matter. And we, of course, know that a very similar mechanism happens to say in two dimensions when you consider two dimensional theories and high enough. Um, high enough multiplicity, then there's enough constraints coming from dimensionalities on, on the kinematic invariants that actually leads to a breakdown of crossing symmetry, for example, in integrable theories. So it's still an open question whether something like this could potentially happen at high multiplicity uh, in high dimensions. So, sorry, what do you mean a breakdown of, of crossing symmetry? If we consider if integrable theories, you, you just have if we consider, I mean, they are not analytic. The, the 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 higher point functions they are they have a support in in the momenta. Yeah, that, 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 that's exactly the problem that we have in say six point three to three scattering. We have no particle production, which tells us that the old two to four vanishes one. And the way that it manifests itself on the level of analyticity is that there no longer exists this single analytic function which we can continue between different processes. The possibility that exists, and in fact, that's what happens, is that there could be multiple analytic functions, and the scattering amplitudes have to be boundary values of multiple functions. And that's how we see, uh, for example, breakdown of crossing symmetry, but also more fundamentally other properties, other, other analytic properties as well. So the question is, does something like this is also is something like this also needed at, um, in, in other dimensions? Okay, and the, the answer is we don't know. Um, okay, so let me let me review briefly what has been done in the in the sixties. So schematically, the the way that Bros, Epstein, and Glasser uh, have been doing this is that they start with position space correlators. Once you once you have that, you can apply the LSZ procedure to to those correlators, and then uh, famously LSZ doesn't compute scattering amplitudes. Instead, it computes optional Green's functions or alternatively scattering amplitudes of vacuums. So then you can infer some properties, analytic properties of that. But the 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 main challenge lies in actually upgrading those properties to uh, properties of onshore scattering amplitudes, which are the observables that you want to to analyze. And crucially, at this step, what we need to do is apply a lot of tools in uh, complex analysis in several variables. And the distinction that I want to do to emphasize here is that the all the physics input, all the uh, all the assumptions that we know from causality and so on, uh, only enter at the first step. And once they are established, um, they're, they're sort of irrelevant for the next steps. And the main meat, all the meat of the proof is actually boiling down to proving these complex analysis. Uh, uh, statements which are completely non-obvious from the sort of more physical perspective. So it would seem that our that our understanding of basically one of the what is supposed to be one of the uh, most fundamental properties of quantum field theories hinges on some technical complex analysis papers from the sixties, which there I say almost no one has read. So um, that of course uh, leads to a question. What can we do about it? So let me emphasize that the problems with crossing symmetry are both technical. So the technical problems is that there are just situations in which we, we don't know if, if it doesn't hold or it does. And also conceptual ones, which are the ones telling us that we don't have a good physical interpretation of what it means because it hinges on these on this, um, complex analysis tools. Okay, so our idea is to re-examine this problem in perturbation theory. And um, as everyone knows, perturbation theory comes with multiple both conceptual and technical advantages. And the general idea is that once we manage to get some physical intuition behind this problem in perturbation theory, later, say for the bootstrap type of um, um, uh, approaches, what we can do is upgrade this understanding to non-perturbative uh, physics, 
But really, the what uh, the, sim the main simplification with perturbation theory for our purposes is that we know exactly what singularities mean in perturbation theory. And what they mean is that they're really saddle points for the word line action. So this is, this is one uh, simplification because it tells us that we can exactly write down some equations. These are the saddle point equations which pinpoint where the singularities are. So if we manage to solve them, in principle, we would have solved for the full analyticity of this covering amplitude. But moreover, they also interpretations are as intermediate particles going on shell. So this, has, this tells us uh, exactly what, what their meaning is. This is the sort of classical limit which, in which we have long-lived particles and we have a well-associated singularities to those. So now what, uh, before explaining that in details, uh, let me just mention that of course people have tried to do something like this in the past, reconstruct a crossing symmetry in perturbation theory. And basically the extent to which any results exist in the literature regarding that is sort of for in the sort of EFT approach in which we consider sufficiently light external states or sufficiently heavy internal states. And there a lot of things can be proven. And uh, there's results due to a lot of people. And the question is, can we actually put a bound on what this sufficiently light means? And it turns out that the answer is yes. There's the, let me just flash this, this result very quickly just to tell you that it can be, it can be made concrete. We can put the, the following bound that you, the MEs here are all the internal masses. And as long as they are heavier, they, there's some bound depending on the external masses, capital M's, using this function at any multiplicity M. Uh, as long as this bound is satisfied, then the crossing symmetry is satisfied as well, at least when N satisfies this, this constraint on the dimension. So uh, all the results in the old literature are basically special cases of, um, of this, this single equation for n equals four and some of the results for n equals five. Okay, so uh, one, uh, one thing, yes. Can I ask just, so um, when you say crossing symmetry satisfies, you mean that the only cuts are the production cuts, the threshold? There are no, no anomalous no. thresholds? Is that what no, you mean? No, 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 that, that's definitely not what I mean. What I mean is that there exists a path of analytic continuation between any physical point and any other physical point, regardless if, of um, which physical region they're in. This does but not then, imply, this does not necessarily, this implies that there's no anomalous thresholds along the path of deformation, but right. it does not imply that there cannot be anomalous thresholds somewhere else. So, so I guess there is a similar constraint for the absence of anomalous thresholds, right? If it's light enough, maybe it's not such a general result. But... You, you, it would certainly make sense that such shipping exists, but um, I wouldn't know how to quantify it right now. Well, at least uh, for four particle, right? If it's the lightest particle. Yes. So, so you would you would imagine that a similar constraint when you apply to to um, n equals four, uh, you would imply it might, may or may not imply maximal analyticity. But what I'm saying is that I don't know what the answer to this question is, and I'm pretty sure that the answer doesn't exist in, in the literature. Okay. Okay. What, what this would certainly imply in those cases is that if you keep T fixed and then you look at the S plane, then there's no anomalous thresholds in the S plane for fixed T, but not necessarily as you write T as well. Okay, so one strategy that you might imagine is that, well, can we just optimize this bound all the way to zero such that every any possible processes um, is included? And that's certainly a valid, valid approach, but it's uh, the one that I wanted to take in this talk is the approach is slightly different. What we're going to do in this talk is what we're going to do first is we're going to identify all the classes of singularities or all the anomalous thresholds that could pose a potential obstruction to crossing symmetry. And let me let me just explain briefly what those potential obstructions would be. They would tell you that. Um, there is a special class of anomalous thresholds in which all the internal particles, let's say you have some big Feynman diagrams with, with, with many loops. If all the particles are aligned exactly in two, di two directions, the directions of the external particles like so. So if the process looks on the singularity like scattering of two beams of, of particles and at most they can exchange master states, 
um, um, then that's a specific class of anomalous thresholds. And the question of crossing symmetry basically boils down to the question of does your theory have these kind of similarities or does it not? If it doesn't, then crossing symmetry holds. If it does have the singularities, then at least in the way that, that I'm performing the analytic continuation it has an obstruction, but there might be other ways. Okay, so what we're going to explain in the second part of the talk is precisely why such singularities do not exist specifically for planar scattering processes. And this will be sufficient to prove crossing symmetry in those cases. So one complaint might be that planar scattering processes are of course very special, uh, blah, 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 but uh, uh, in the stock we'll be still working in uh, sort of to all loop orders, to all multiplicities, all masses on all spins, etc. So everything will still retain a large degree of generality. Okay, so more concretely, what we're going to show is that if an amplitude in a given channel exists, then the crossed amplitude is given by its analytic continuation. So uh, more concretely, we'll consider a scattering amplitude where the set of incoming states will be split into two non-empty sets A and B, and likewise set of all the outgoing states into two non-empty sets C and D. And what we're going to do is starting with this process, we will analytically continue it into this process in which we exchange some of the um, particles into antiparticles with where C bar denotes the antiparticle. And the basically the meaning of this equality sign in order to make it concrete, what you need to do is prescribe the domains of analyticity and exact path of analytic continuation. And that will be the, basically the content of this talk explaining what this exactly means. But before diving into specific details, let me just illustrate what's going to happen on a cartoon level so that we can add some picture and then we'll go into, into more details in the talk. So here's the here's some Feynman diagram for a given process of the type that I was describing here. We have incoming particles with the sets A and B and outgoing ones with the sets C and D, such that everything is ordered in the planar um, ordering um, A, B, C, D. Then what we want to do is relate these kind of Feynman diagrams. We wanted to analytically continue them into, into these ones where um, where the some of the particles have been, the, this diagram has been basically been rotated. Um, and as you can see, I got bored of drawing the loops. So you can imagine that there's some surface and there's some many loops in, in, in that surface. Okay, so then what we're going to do is we're going to, uh, this analytic continuation will proceed in five steps. Okay, five steps are illustrated here. So let me just explain the, the, the first one to begin with. In the first one, what we're going to do is just start with by deforming the momenta of the external particles from the sets A and B. So we deform the external momenta in such a way that the onshore conditions and mass uh, and the moment of conservation are still preserved. And of course, as you tune the, these momenta, you could encounter some singularities. So what we'll have to learn is exactly how to avoid those singularities. And we'll see that there's always some absolute uh, prescription for avoiding going around such anomalous thresholds. And once we get, once we learn how to do it, what we go, the way that we're going to utilize it is that we're going to, to move, sort of change the exchange, the positions of these two, such that as a result of this first step, we're going to have particles B and particles in the set C on the opposite side of the sort of positive axis of the, of the light plot. Okay, once this is done, what we, what's going to happen is that we're going to then rotate in the complexification of the light cone, um, the particles from the set C and those from B, uh, such that they exchange their nature from particles to antiparticles. So sort of using, as a result, we'll have a picture like this. Okay, and then once we know how to how to do the step one and two, then the rest is just copy and paste with different permutations. Okay, so in this step three, we just rotate these two such that as a result, we have uh, particles A and B bar aligned close to the axis. Then we'll rotate that again uh, um, in the using complex directions, landing on a configuration like this. And in the final step, we'll just untwist this diagram 
such that we land on the um, on the target. Okay, so let me let me emphasize that each diagram here represents exactly a configuration of Feynman diagram that we do a path integral over uh, whatever all loop momenta and all or Schwinger parameters or something like this. And the the statement is that along this path of deformation, singularities cannot appear. Okay, and now the question is how do we use it? And the way that that one example in which you can use it is that you can start with this process, for example, one, two, going to three, four, five, and then you can start splitting these things into different sets using the general procedure A, B, C, D, and you can start applying this. And it turns out in this example, if you apply it, apply this analytic continuation three times, then you land on this process in which instead of particle five in the original one, we have an antiparticle phi bar in the target with all the remaining states uh, being unchanged. And this is exactly uh, the first example of crossing symmetry as sort of realizing this dream of Stuckelberg that you can have two uh, processes, one including a particle, one including an antiparticle, and they can be actually continued between uh, one another. Um, so um, do we have any questions maybe at this stage? If not, then let me very quickly illustrate the Lorentz invariant content of this procedure. Okay, so from concreteness in this talk, we'll consider four point scattering. Basically, everything is going to be, all the steps are going to be very similar for five point scattering. So, all the important um, information is already at four point, in which the sets A, B, C, and D are just single particle one, two, three, and four. And we have the two Mandelstam invariants, S and T. So, then what we can look at is we can look at the, um, the real plane of the Mandelstam invariants, real S and real T. And here we have the S channel, here we have the T channel, and here we have the U. And basically the image of what we've been doing, what I've been explaining on my cartoon level before is that we start with some arbitrary open set um, around some point where the original amplitude is defined. Then as we adjust the momenta within the light cones, we do not cross, um, we, we remain in the same physical region for a given process, but we might cross some lambda some singularities. Okay, so then we learn how to cross those. And then we we'll land on some point here, which is the starting point of the next deformation. And then what we're going to find is that um, when we rotate this rotation in the, in the complex directions will be exactly designed such that in this case, the T invariant stays fixed. Uh, and the only thing that uh, is, is deformed is the S invariant, in the upper half plane. Then we'll see that in planar processes, there's no singularities in this upper half plane. And then this allows us to continue to some neutral place. And then once we once we understand how to do this step and this step, everything else is the same. We can rotate again, blah, 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 go to the T channel um, singularity. And the result is that we manage to continue any planar process starting from a, some non-singular point in the S channel, landing in a non-singular point in the T channel. So let me stress that, uh, of course, for two to two scattering, this analytic continuation can be done in a simpler ways. But the, the reason why I wanted to, um, to, to, to explain this more complicated five step procedure is that this is exactly the one that is going to have some nice physical interpretation. It is also the one that generalizes um, to arbitrary multiplicity. Um, and I believe also is that this has a chance of working for non-planar amplitudes. So one of the points of this is that I didn't want to assume too strongly planarity, as we'll see in this talk, planarity only enters at the final step of the procedure. So hopefully, hopefully that can be sorted out um, soon. So the outline of this talk is that we're going, we're going to start by reviewing the Landau equations, which are the equations for the style points in the world line formalism. Then what we what I'm going to explain is that um, the particular way that energy flows in planar diagrams, which will turn out to be crucial to understand the, the physical meaning of crossing symmetry in those cases. And then in the next points, I will tell you how to do analytic continuation close to the physical regions and the ones in the crossing domains, which are these complex, complex directions. And finally, we'll put everything together. 
So the conversions will be that the, the standard ones that the particle momenta will be denoted with P with the additional minus sign for the outgoing states such that the momentum conservation can be simply written as this. And everything will be on the support of the onshore conditions, which uh, were here capital M's will be the masses of external particles. And I will be working in the mostly minus signature. Okay, so a lot of equations. So first of all, to make the, the question of crossing symmetry well posed, what we need to do is we need to assume that the amplitude exists in the first place. But of course, we can always um, do that by removing all the overall divergences in perturbation theory uh, using some renormalization or regularization procedure. So even though, even if your amplitude doesn't exist, you can still talk about say amplitude in dim rag and that always exists. So, um, so in that sense, we would be able to do um, analytic continuation. And then once we have that for any CPT invariant PFT, uh, which admits local quantity, Feynman rules, what we can do is expand it in terms of Feynman, Feynman integrals. So let me just quickly explain the notation here. Here L is are the loop momenta, where capital D is the space-time dimension. Capital L is the number of loops, okay? Here we could have some numerator, which coming from contractions of, vert of Feynman vertices, which is equal to one for the scalar. So let, let's just focus on the scalar at first. And then here we have some product of some numerator for propagators for every internal edge. Okay, so capital E will denote the number of propagators. And here the notation is that QE is the momentum flowing for a given edge. ME is the mass of that edge. Um, and of course we have momentum conservation at every vertex. Okay, so then the standard standard next step in doing the um, in this procedure is to introduce Schwinger parameters. Okay, so Schwinger parameters alpha e associated to every edge. So the, the way you do it is using this, this, this trick in which you write the, this propagator as an exponential integrated over the um, Schwinger parameter from zero to infinity. And from this perspective, the I epsilon prescription imposes convergence of this integral at infinity. Okay, so then what you want to do is you want to apply this to every propagator. And once you do it, on top of the usual loop momenta, we also have now E Schwinger parameters. Um, and everything, of course, organizes into a nice exponential, like so. So here, this factor V is simply the sum of um, these factors that enter in the, um, in the exponents. Okay. Sebastian, can I ask a question? Yes, please. So if you set n equal to one, I, I guess it's more than uh, requiring a scalar particle. So you are actually requiring essentially a potential interaction. I, yeah, I mean, you can have it, right? So yeah. it's, uh, okay. So are so, you going to work with this assumption? Or? No, no, no. So what we're going to see is that the scalar di or diagrams with uh, unit numerators are the ones that are the most singular. And once you, you once you start including additional numerators, they can they can remove some land of singularities, but they cannot introduce new ones. So that's why I wanted to focus on on this case first. Okay, thanks. Okay, so thank you. Though, that I should have said that. So um, we're at this stage, okay. And at this stage, of course, what we can what we can do now we have an H bar in in here. So what we can do is look at the classical limit. So classical limit is dominated by the saddle points. So at first, let's ignore boundaries. Let's just talk about saddle points in the bulk of the integration domain. And what you have to do is take, take this V and start varying it with respect to L's and, and, and shrinking parameters. So as we vary it in the in loop momenta, because everything here, the internal momenta Q were linear in the, in the loop momenta, we get, we, after variation, we get a quantity like this, which tells us that around every loop here, around every loop, we have to consider the quantities, the momenta times the Schrodinger parameters, of course, with the appropriate orientation, um, and they have to add up to zero. Okay, so that's the first cell point constraint. And the second one is 
is actually much easier, which is very with respect to showing your parameters. So for any edge, it gives us this constraint. And that constraint is, of course, the depart filters to go on shell. Okay, so these together, these, these, these constraints together are known as the leading Landau equations, and they themselves give us necessary conditions for singularities. So let me just summarize them here. Um, for every vertex, we have momentum conservation. For every loop, we have this continuity law that I mentioned before. And for every edge, we have the onshore constraint. So as usual, when you have a problem like this, it's useful to split it in, in terms of the linear part and the quadratic part. So it turns out that the linear ones can be always solved. And then the, in order to constrain where the singularities of the amplitudes can be, what we're going to do is take this linear solution and plug it in into the quadratic part and see what kind of constraints we get. And let me just briefly mention, I, I think I'm back, um, I'm behind on time. So let me just briefly mention that there's of course also boundary saddle points. Um, there's the ones, called subleading Landau equations, which, which correspond to Schunger parameters are they going to zero and infinity, but these give exactly the same constraints, just for a simpler diagram, but we already consider all classes of diagrams. So they're already contained in our analysis. And similarly, there's the second types singularities, which are the boundaries in the loop momenta. And, but this only happen in special configuration um, special kinematic configurations such as collinear limits, so they're not important for us. Okay, so then what we're going to do next is that we can notice that in the previous rep representation, everything was Gaussian in the momentum, so we can just integrate out this Gaussian, okay? So as, once we integrate out the momentum, we, um, we end up with only integral in terms of alphas, times some Jacobian that we picked up, u, raised to the power of d over two, um, times the, this, this, the same quantity here, exponential of this, of this v plus some i epsilons. And the exponential of the, sorry, the v is exactly the same as before, but now evaluated on, the, on, the, on these um, Gaussian saddle points, which means that it's the same function as before, but now you solve for um, what the internal momenta are in terms of the Landau constraints. Okay, so as a result, you get a function which is purely in terms of Mandelstam invariance and Schwinger parameters. And here, let me mention the, the, the thing that, that we um, already discussed briefly is that what you can do is, of course, you can start including these spin interactions and also, of course, higher derivative, whatever, scalar interactions and so on. And then all, all you will boil down to is that they will produce some additional numerator in here, okay, polynomial. And uh, as I mentioned before, this polynomial can change the nature of singularities, can remove singularities, but cannot introduce new singularities. So the analysis, because we're concerned only in the necessary conditions, the necessary conditions are already the most general they can be. Okay, so um, here we need to explain, first of all, uh, what this V is and what this, what this U is. Okay, so U turns out it can be actually, it's purely um, fixed by combinatorics of the diagram, but it will not be super important for this talk. Let me just mention that there's some explicit expressions in terms of summing or the spanning trees, so pure combinatorics. However, this V, the V that, that was here has a different interpretation, okay? So it turns out that this V is nothing that the word line action. Okay, so to those of you who are familiar with, with string theory, you know that if we have a free, free action on a, uh, well, in this case, on a word line um, coupled to some sources, the, after you localize all the fields, what you end up with is this sort of um, uh, double sum over the contractions of all the extra momenta with the Green's function that measures the response to, to including those momenta. Okay, like so. So just solutions of some um, uh, Laplace equations. And then we have these corrections from the masses. Okay, sum over all the masses squared times the, times the Schrodinger parameters. Okay, so at this stage, what, um, what we're 
we can notice is that this action is actually homogeneous, which is related to the fact that we can dilate the full diagram and the action just picks up an overall factor. So as we as we change all the all the Schrodinger parameters with a constant um, dilation factor lambda, the action just is homogeneous with weight one. And this looks innocent at the beginning, but actually it has three extremely important properties, or rather consequences. Okay, so the, the first one is that the action vanishes on the saddle point, which sounds quite unusual. So let me remind you that the, the constraint on the saddle point was this onshow um, onshow constraint, but because the action is homogeneous, this quantity, this equality holds, just applying this dilation operator to the, to the action gives you the action back. And crucially on the saddle point, all of these derivatives vanish. So this tells you that the action has to vanish as well. Okay. Second important fact is the, the fact that everything was projective again, independent of this overall scale. So we can, we can solve for the cell point equations uh, up to this overall scale. And that this means that we actually get E constraints where E was the number of propagators for exactly E minus one variables. And this means that generically we have one constraint left over, and this is exactly the constraint that is going to constrain not only the Schrodinger parameters, but also the external kinematics. That's why singularities only happen at special, saddle points only happen at special places in the kinematic space. Okay, and then finally, what we can do is we can actually see what this effect of the overall scale is. So we can actually factor, factor it out. So just do this change of variables. And we've already seen that the action picks up the overall lambda. This, this u factor picks up some, is also homogeneous with lambda to the L, it doesn't matter. And then the, the measure behaves like this. So then after you collect all the factors of lambda, you end up with, with this integral left to do. Okay, and here, this, this factor of gamma, all the numerators, all, the, all these powers exactly coincides such that this power of gamma is the E times E minus L times D over two, which is called the degree of divergence for a given diagram. Okay, and if you just simply do this integral, you end up with this factor. And the point here is that on the cell points, V is equal to zero. So even if you include some epsilon description, there's no way you can save it and you have a singularity. Okay. So all these three facts combined tell us that uh, word line saddle points give singularities of the of these curving amplitudes, and these singularities are historically referred to as anomalous pressures. And finally, let me mention that causality here was imposed by inserting this factor of i epsilon sort of by hand. But instead, what we're going to do in this talk is to deform the integration contour or deform the external kinematics to the same effect. And all that it's really doing is selecting the correct homology class of contours that you're supposed to be integrating over, such that it imposes the fact that the imaginary part of the action remains positive. Okay, so that's that's a constraint coming from causality. Okay, so now let's let's discuss this on a on a basic diagram on a basic example of this box box diagram here. Okay, so we have some external legs with momenta p one, two, three, and four, and internal ones q one, two, three, and four. Okay, so you can compute what the CO is just given by by enumerating spanning trees. It doesn't matter. Then what you can do is you can write the Landau equations. So we have the momentum conservation at the vertex and this, this equation around the loop, okay? And then if you solve it, you get, you get the solution of this form. And at the beginning, it doesn't look highly illuminating, but let's look slightly closer. More specifically, we can look at the energy component of this. Okay, so mu equals zero. And the reason why the energy component is interesting is that, of course, the external kinematics has definite energies. So what we can do is, for example, look at the this this process in which one two is incoming and three and four is outgoing. And then what we can do is, for example, look at the second edge here. And if you look at the equation, 
um, with the constraint that this quantity is positive, the this this is positive. P three, the energy component of P three was negative, so this quantity is positive as well, and this one is positive as well. So this tells us that on the on the saddle point, the energy of the edge the second edge can only flow in one direction. And if you work out what this direction is, is this direction up. Okay, so what we what we found is that if you apply momenta in this energy in this direction, then the one along the, the edge has to flow in the like direction. And you can do a similar similar computation to find out what it is supposed to be for the, uh, the other edge and because of symmetry is actually flowing in the same direction as well. Okay. So the statement tells us that if there is a singularity, the energy can only flow along the causal direction along the sides of a planar diagram. And this turns out to be a completely general fact that if you consider any planar diagrams with any number of loops, and then you apply this, this, these energies in the way that is drawn here, the, the energy of the, along the propagators, along the sides of this diagram is to flow in this causal direction. Okay, and one way of, uh, well, I guess there's many ways of understanding this, but one way is that what we're doing is we're really extremizing the action. So it's supposed to minimize the total Lorentz length of this diagram. So it would be, of course, suboptimal if the energy started flowing back and forth because this would not minimize the length. Okay, so that's one explanation. If you don't trust this explanation, you can also go through explicit computation in terms of spanning trees, and it tells you the same thing. Okay, so do we have any questions maybe about this? If not, then that... Maybe about, but what about, so in the other horizontal uh, propagators, ah. it's not, uh, anything can happen, so what is... Uh... Yeah, exactly. So, so we can already see. As, um, um, I skipped it. We can we can see in um, already in these examples that the energy can flow either this way or this way. It's just not constrained. So it means that along the for different part different values of showing your parameters, both can happen. And actually, what's what's crucial for what will be crucial for our later purposes is that it's also allowed that the energy flowing through this through, through this edge and this edge can be zero. And that cannot happen along this edge and this edge it has to be strictly positive. Okay. So the same is of course uh, happening for more complicated diagrams. The energy can sort of flow back and forth in different ways, but along these edges it always has to flow up. Okay, so I'm way behind. So let me move on to the to the next um, section, which is the analyticity in your physical regions. So this section doesn't assume planarity at all. Okay, so physical regions, for example, we can look at some fixed T and S, and if we do that, the physical region could be somewhere in this, this axis. And what um, what we're going to constrain is behavior, the analyticity in this small neighborhood around this axis, and there could be some singularity somewhere away, which is we're just not going to say anything about those. And um, close to these axes, crucially, we could have things like branch point and branch cuts. So let me distinguish between the two. The first ones are the points which are actually singular. Branch points are the ones that would have um, be solutions of the Landau equations. And the branch cuts are the non singular parts. So there's nothing special happening at the branch, um, branch point. Um, so we can consider those, okay? So in fact, what, what we're going to do is we're going to deform the, rotate the Schwinger parameters as well as rotate the external kinematics such that it proves analyticity in the neighborhood of these, these kind of regions. And it turns out that you have to distinguish between singular and non-singular points because they have the, the leading effect comes either from the Schwinger parameters or external kinematics. So let's first focus on the non-singular points, okay? So non-singular point is the one where Landau equation is not satisfied, but the action can still be zero. Okay, so what we're going to do is simply in deform the integration contour, okay? So it amounts to some change of variables from the original Schrodinger parameters, some new Schrodinger parameters 
alpha check. And it turns out that there's actually a canonical way of doing this. All you have to do is you, you these deform stringer parameters, add some small phase to the, to the original ones. And we're going to design this phase in precisely such a way that, it, that there's this quantity for a given edge E that vanishes on show. Okay, so once we expand this, the epsilon here is some small parameter. So once we expand this, we of course get the original thing plus some odd order epsilon corrections that are proportional to these factors. And then what we can do is see how what effect this has on the on the action. Okay, so the action evaluated on these uh, cell points. What we can do is we can um, tailor expand it in this small parameter. So to leading order, we have the original action, and to first sub leading order, we just tailor expand in terms of this infinitesimal parameters here. So we plan there; they are here times the first derivative. But we already know that the first derivative is the is this quantity to begin with. So it just combines with this one into a square. Okay, so we, what we end up with is that we've deformed the integration contours precisely in such a way that we've added some i epsilon corrections. And those i epsilon corrections um, can only vanish if all these, all these factors here are zero. But this would be a solution of Landau equations, and we, we assume that it doesn't exist. So it means that this is always strictly positive, close to a non zero point. Okay, so the, the, the conclusion is that for sufficiently small epsilon, it implements the correct causality conditions. And now this is not the end. Moreover, what we can do is we can now do also similar deformations in the external kinematics, but we can do it in such a way that they're subleading sub -leading to, the, to the contour deformations. So any effect that they would have is would be contained in these subleading terms, okay? So this tells us that if we, in addition, we deform the external kinematics, there's always some neighborhood in which we find an altistic. And that neighborhood is sort of of this order um, epsilon squared. Okay, so that's the summary of the um, of this analytic continuation of this of this deformation is that we slightly we slightly deform the the branch cuts and we see analytic close to these non singular points here. But is so is this an if is this an infinitesimal region, or you can prove some finite size? Yeah. So, so what this what this proves what what you have to do in addition to that, you have to show that the remainder terms are uh, bounded, um, but they are, and this this shows that there exists sufficiently small epsilon for which there is an altitude. So it's really an infinitesimal region. But, and you can, I think you can try to optimize this and, and see how large you can make it and so on. But for our purposes, this will be completely enough. Because the only thing that we wanted to do is connect different regions. And you can always do it with some epsilon deformations. And in fact, we're not done yet. What we also have to prove is that, um, that you can also have an autistic close to these singular points, which is a more difficult thing to do. And it turns out it can only be done from certain directions. Okay, so for example, in, the, in this example, we can we can have analytic in this direction above the um, above the singular point in this picture, but not necessarily below. Okay, so you can go for the for the derivation, or I can go through it um, after the talk if someone is interested. But the upshot is that we, we also have an LTC of this type, and it exactly allows us to continue around singularities between different disconnected regions in the real kinematic space. Okay, and that's exactly that's exactly what we wanted. We wanted some way of deforming around these London singularities such that you can freely go between any non-singular point in this in this kinematic domain. Okay, so what we've learned is that we can do this, this step one of the deformation. And now what we have to, so we are somewhere here. And first of all, we need to prescribe what it means to start, what is the starting point of the next step. 
And second of all, why, why is there unlisted in this upper plane? Okay, so this is what, the, uh, what I'm going to do next. But do we have any, any other questions in the meantime? Maybe uh, if, uh, so in the examples that we know that there are anomalous thresholds um, inside this S plane, like when you, for example, have uh, heavy external masses, so this, so they they will appear like some finite distance away, and that that's why it's compatible with always have this analyticity on top of the real axis. That that's what. So the, there are there are two statements. First of all, there could be even so. This is what I was trying to go in this picture, that there could be these normal thresholds. There would be just some fixed masses. There could be also anomalous thresholds that live exactly in this real that intersect this real slice. And this behave exactly in the same way as the normal ones. There's just no distinction from the from this perspective. So we can also continue between them. They could also be anomalous thresholds somewhere somewhere here. So there could be some thresholds here, maybe some cuts or some singularities. And the statement here is that they cannot be, they cannot be, they cannot be. Um, there always exists an infinitesimal region in which they do not, they do not approach the real slice. Thank you. Okay, though. so now let, let, let us move on to the final part of the talk, which is the analysticity in this crossing the mass. Okay, so the first step is what we're going to do is we're going to choose a Lorentz frame and we are going to choose it in the, in the light concordance, okay? So coordinates are like this, where the, we have some plus, minus, and the space-like components. And the specific frame that we're going to choose is that we're going to choose the plus and minus components of the particle three here to be exactly the opposite of the dose of the particle two. Okay, so we can always do it, and we can always go to a frame in which the same thing happens for the particle four, that the P4 plus is equal to this and P4 minus is equal to this. And of course, we want the kinematics to be still non-singular, so we require that the re remaining things are general. Okay, so this is just the, just the choice of the Lorentz frame. And um, yeah, in this, in this frame, the masses of the particles are just even like this, and the momentum conservation just imposes constraints on the space type components. Now, what we're going to impose is that the, okay, so the, the situation looks like follow, as follows in the, in, the, in the slight concordance, is that we went to a frame in which the momentum of the particle one and four in the slight con, um, coordinates um, are diametrically opposed on the on the opposite sides. And likewise, those of two and four, two and three are also opposed. Okay, and on top of that, what we're going to impose that is you, if you measure this angle here, so this angle is essentially measuring the rapidity, we're going to impose that this angle here is smaller than this angle here meaning that the particle two is just closer to the other side of the act, to the positive side of the light cone than the particle one, okay? So more concretely is this, this, this kind of constraint, okay? This tells us this angle is smaller than this. So this is going to define the starting point of the step two of the analytic continuation. And now what we wanted to do so we know that we can always go to this to this step using the deformations that I was I was discussing in the slides before. And now what we want to do is of course we wanted to continue from positive energies to negative energies. So I'm going to do it specifically for the particles two and three, like so. So I'm starting with these light cone coordinates in which they were on the opposite sides of the light cones, two and three, were here and here. What I'm going to do is now I'm going to add a small complex parameter Z, okay? Precisely in such a way that the masses are not deformed. So everything is still on shell. Um, and what I'm going to do is what we start with is this, this point here where Z is equal to one and the target is Z equals to minus one because I wanted to exchange the energies from positive to negative and vice versa. 
And the way that we're going to do it is that in this Z plane, we're going to go to the upper plane. And we're also going to go outside of the uh, unit circle. Okay, so the analytic continuation will happen in this in this domain. So this is what I call the crossing domain. So now let's see what happens to the Mandelstam invariance. First of all, we can look at the S kinematic invariant, more specifically at its imaginary value, imaginary part. Okay, so because we deformed P2, it's all, you, this is the only thing that gets deformed with Z. And after you do the math, what you find is that everything is proportional to in Z times this quantity. And we already assumed that we're outside of the unit circle. So this tells us that this one over Z all squared is smaller than one. And also that this quantity is, is positive by requiring this constraint that one of the angles was smaller than the other. Sebastian, okay. sorry, I, I missed the point. So uh, is the ex external kinematic, uh, the, the momenta are uh, away from an anomalous threshold or uh, you're considering, uh, are you ah. assuming that P1? So, so we, oh, sorry. So we assume that here they are. So we assume that the, at the beginning of the deformation, we're on some singular point, non-singular point, okay? So basically at the beginning of the deformation, we're somewhere here. So let's say we can always avoid being exactly on the anomalous threshold. So we're going to assume that we go to some place where we're away from it. And then what we need to find now is that the fact that there's no anomalous at this point implies also that there's no anomalous thresholds here. But that we need to prove this. Okay. So um, okay. So then we do this, and the 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 conclusion was that the imaginary part of S, as we deform it, stays positive. And the T, because we only deform the particles two and three by momentum conservation, this cancels with this. Okay, so the T kinematic invariant remains fixed. Okay, so this tells us that the along the path of deformation, T is fixed, but we just go to S upper half plane. Okay, so the sort of the imaginary directions, what you might, the way that you might think about it is that the, um, the, the, the imaginary parts of the masses are zero, imaginary part of the T are zero. So the only scale that is um, in the problem is the imaginary part of S. So from this sort of imaginary directions, it looks like a highly energetic scattering process, even, for, even though in reality, the, all the Mandelstam invariants are actually finite. Okay, so now what we wanted to show is that, um, I'm supposed to be finishing about now, right? So what we're going to show now is that um, Lando equations cannot have singularities along the path of deformation. Okay, so first of all, we're going to use the linearity of the linear Lando equations, which tell us that the momenta of internal particles, they can you can always split them into two smaller problems. The one in which you probe the the problem of just applying external momenta in the P2 directions. And also another problem in which you probe it in the other directions proportional to P1. So this tells you that the internal momenta on the on the Landau solution of Landau equations would have to look like um, something proportional to P2 times this function F. And this function of F measures the the energy flow, the momentum flow uh, in which is proportional to these directions. Likewise, G sub E measures the momentum flow in the opposite directions. And now what we can do is we can apply this to quadratic Landau equations. So you just impose this onshore constraint for every edge. And what you find is that if you look at the imaginary part of this, you just do some, do some math, you find that as expected, everything is proportional to what we've seen before. This in Z, which was already, we knew it's already positive, times this quantity, which we already knew is positive as well. And, but now, time, but now times the, these functions F, F and G. Okay, so the F and G were telling us about um, 
measuring the momentum flow proportional to this direction and this direction. So now we can ask, well, when can singularities actually happen? So singularities require that the onshore conditions are satisfied. And they, they, in this case, they tell us that this quantity has to be zero, which has only three possibilities. The possibilities are that either f is equal to zero. Okay, so this solution would tell us f equals to zero is that this doesn't this doesn't appear. So the internal momentum would have to be purely proportional to p1 directions. Likewise, there's this other solution g equals zero, which tells us the exact opposite that this does, this did. This doesn't appear, which means that the momenta would have to be proportional in the opposite directions. And, and likewise, there's also the third possibility that both are zero at the same time, which tells you that the momenta in the light cone directions are exactly zero. Okay. So these three possibilities give you the only way that a possible anomalous threshold could appear in this case. And these are the, the situations in which we exactly have these two beams of particles exchanging massless states. Okay, so every internal edge falls into this category, this or this one. And now what you want to do is in order, in order to prove crossing symmetry is that you need, to, you need to prove that in your theory, such anomalous thresholds cannot exist. But we already know from what we've seen before that this cannot this exactly is excluded precisely because of the energy flow. Okay, so if we look at yeah, any planar Feynman diagram now, we see that we can we can apply the momentum in this direction of the two and three, and we can apply it in terms of one and four. And by the same arguments as before, we know that on the edges of the planar diagram, the energy has to flow in a certain direction. So if you track it down, it's, it has to flow in this direction, here and here, and likewise here. And for the other case, you can also track down how it flows, okay, from the sink to the source. And now the question is, once we superimpose those on top of each other, um, what we see is that there exists certain edges, such as this one here, in which the energy is guaranteed to flow in both directions at the same time. Okay, so there's some non-zero component in this direction, proportional to P2, and some non-zero component in the other direction. And this, of course, is in the in direct contradiction with this, um, with this because it told us that, that this quantity cannot be zero. Okay, so we conclude that the imaginary parts of the onshore constraints can never be zero. And this means that there's never singularities along the path of deformation. And the amplitude is completely analytic. There's actually only one exception to this, which are the so-called one vertex reducible diagrams, which look like this. And in those cases, the energy actually flow actually stops at the single vertex. But these diagrams are inoffensive anyway, because they're as independent. So if the amplitude was well-defined to begin with, it's also going to be well-defined as the form the S. Okay, so now I, I'm supposed to be finishing now, I guess. Yes. <laughs> I mean, so let, me, me. let me put everything together in one final, final slide, which is that we explain how to do analytic continuation between diagrams of this type and diagrams of this type and there were basically two important ingredients. One is that we can adjust the momenta of external particles, avoiding Landau singularities using I epsilon prescriptions. And this allowed us to, to move from this configuration to this configuration. Then what we've learned is that once we land on some, some configuration here, what we can do is we can start deforming the amplitude in this, kinemat in this um, complexified kinematics and we've shown that for planar diagrams, there's no singularities in these upper half plane planes as well. Okay, so this completed the second step, and then the rest is just the same with different labelings. And this proved crossing symmetry between scarping amplitudes of this type and scarping amplitudes of this type, um, which is, I guess, where I wanted to stop. So 
Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Are there any further questions? I, I had one question. Is this statement about just uh, like a given finite order in perturbation theory or about the full planar theory? Because you can imagine that the singularities, uh, the anomalous thresholds would become dense and there wouldn't be even an infinitesimal region where you could make an argument. Yeah, this is it. Every finite order, every finite loop order. Yes. So, so it's not a statement about the planar theory. Um, I, I agree that you would have to make an additional statement that tells you that the, the, the singularities cannot condense. But I actually, I, I think this might have been already proven. That's what? It, it might be, uh, so people considered these kind of problems before. And I think it might, well, I would have to look up if, if this was proven. Okay. But thank you. So it, there, is a, there is a statement that the planar perturbation theory has a fine radius of convergence. I don't know how rigorous that statement is, but certainly that's what one hears all the time. You mean N equals four? No, very generally just by counting planar diagrams. I think it's generally believed that that uh, has a fine rate of convergence, but I don't know exactly in which kinematic region. And you know, I, you know, you're obviously doing things at, at a level of rigor that is superior to the statement I'm making, but I wonder whether that kind of thinking could be used to extend your results to the full planar theory. Yeah, that, that, that's a good question. So it would be finite radius of convergence in terms of uh, the coupling constant, right? And the, the question yes, is, of the, of the coupling, yes. true for every, is it true in a dense set in, in the physical region? Yeah. yeah. I have a cheap question uh, along these lines, which is uh, different lines, but you know, st at the same level of, of uh, cheap, which is um, there's, of course, this program of, of deriving the, the flat space as matrix as a limit of, um, a of ADS with large radius. Mm -hmm. uh, now, it, it, it would seem that in ADS, crossing is sort of obvious because it follows from the crossing, crossing axioms of, of safety correlators. So could there be a program to deriving crossing symmetry completely generally, um, sorry, perturbatively the, by... The, the, the way you said it is that it's obvious because we assume it in CFT or... Yes, because we're assuming it's because, because it's sort of part of the... Right, I mean... It, but there's some rigorous statements there as well. Okay. There's a rigorous yeah. statement CFT yeah. that the crossing symmetry is, is a fact. Um, yeah, that, that, that's a very interesting question. In fact, the one that would likely, this could be one pathway in which you could start to argue with something like this non perturbatively. Um, but the, the, I think what we might be doing is just shuffling the problem of crossing in flat space onto the problem of crossing on the level of CFT. And then that you have to prove, and as far as I understand, proving that also there's, um, there's different arguments, of course, but the most rigorous ones are the ones that use sort of complicated, um, complex analysis. And that, that, that's the thing that I want to avoid in here. I want to have some more physical picture of what's going on. Can I ask a more general question? I mean, your talk was based about showing various regions of analyticity um, near the physical region. I mean, what hope have we of proving something which is equivalent to say the Mandelstam representation, say for planar diagrams? Um, well, in general, I believe we have zero hope because we know that the Mandelstam representation is not true for general masses. Well, in certain restrictions, but... Uh, yeah, so we have to, this is sort of related to the question, I think, was it Joao? Um, at, the, at the beginning, can we prove more, can we prove at least in perturbation theory that there's no anomalous thresholds given that the external masses are sufficiently light? Um, 
And the, the question is essentially, what can we put a bound on what, what sufficiently light means? Um, I think it's a very interesting question. It might be it might not be that difficult to, to answer right now, actually. Well, there was a program to try and prove it, which was didn't work in the distant past. But uh, I just don't know whether modern techniques would allow us to go further. Yeah, that, that, that's a great question, but I have not I have not thought of it. <laughs> Any but, further questions? But you would necessarily have to be of this type, uh, statement of this type that would have to be some bound on the masses below which the Madison representation could, could be true. But, but do you know do you know any counterexample? I mean, we, we know a lot about perturbative diagrams and so we can get at least some reasonable conjecture of what can happen and what cannot happen. No? The counterexample on the the, the masses, you mean? The, 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 for the band on the masses? Okay, so yeah. the... Five, three, four, if, we, if you have a guess, right, there is a... So, so as far, so if we go back to, to this statement, um, the, the statement that I'm familiar with, or the thing that I was tracking myself was that, what? that provided that this bound is satisfied for multiplicity four, there's no counterexamples to that I know of on, of Mandelstam representation. But if this bound is violated, there are counterexamples, including the ones that were known in the, in the 60s. Yeah. So this is this seems like it might be. Yeah, I don't I don't want to say anything concrete actually. Um, but 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 it's true that there's no counterexamples in simple finding diagrams. Of course, the problem is that in practice, solving Landau equations becomes very difficult beyond um, sort of, uh, beyond free loops. So, so may maybe I can ask another question about the role of planarity, because I think you were hinting that maybe it's not so important that non-planar diagrams might also, you mm -hmm. might be able to generalize your arguments to non-planar diagrams. Yeah, so, um, so this statement that, that was made here, that the only singularities that could prevent crossing symmetry in the specific path of analytic continuation that I was making are these diagrams. And this is a complete general statement. Um, and it so happens that for planar diagrams, they, these, this cannot appear. And you would hope that you can also explain for non-planar diagrams why, why it does not appear either but perhaps using some more complicated arguments. And we know now that for special classes of non-planar diagrams, you can still pull off, a, pull off a version of this kind of argument with energies and they cannot simultaneously be zero in both directions. Um, but that's so far only for like the special classes of diagrams. And I think uh, this, this might include all diagrams up to three lobes or something like this, but, but, um, but we still have no but but you don't have a counterexample of a of a non-planar diagram that would actually be singular in this kind of configuration. In in four dimensions, no. Yeah. Okay. So it's it's encouraging. And I should also say that the um, these if you wanted to map these old results of Gross and collaborators onto what what I'm doing here. The way that they would work is that they've proven analyticity not in this domain, but sort of in a, um, something that would look like maybe uh, this. There would be some large domain that you can you can go between plus and plus one and minus one, but you have to go to sort of asymptotically large energies. So there is a hope that once you make this kind of simplification, maybe that is something that well. It, we know that it holds non perturbatively so we would hope that using this simp additional simplification, you can also make some arguments for non planar diagrams in perturbation theory. But that's still um, work in progress. Okay. If there's nothing else, we can thank our speaker again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.